And good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, beloved. I want to welcome welcome you all to community check-in. Um, I would like to talk to those of you who are not going to watch this live. If you're not watching this live, then I want to encourage you. Uh, I want to encourage you to fast forward to whatever part is meaningful for you. If you fast forward about 20 minutes or so, uh, we'll start the word and start the prayer. Uh, in between now and then, we kind of say hello to each other. We check in, we give prayer requests, uh, we do a question of the day. So if any of that interests you, then stick around. If you're live, you don't have any choice. If you're going to stay on, you're going to stick around for it all. Uh, but the most important thing is, whether you're going to stick around or not, uh, I always tell you, I would love for you to at least say hello. I would love for you to at least say hello. So if you're coming in and you see me right now, even if you're not going to stay, just say hello and tell me how you're doing. And then if you have to go, I totally understand. Uh, for those of you who are coming in, though, uh, I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to Community Check-In. I see several of us are slowly creeping in onto this live. Um, as you all are creeping in, come on and say hello. Uh, and then our first thing uh, that we ought to do, as always, is I'm going to ask that you, there it is, somebody did it right before I pushed it, like and share. And that's what I'm about to do right now on my phone. I'm about to find this live and I'm going to like and share myself. Um, thank you to those of you who have already liked and who have already shared. For those of you on YouTube, for those of you on Facebook, um, I'm very, very grateful for you today. All right. Let me like. There's my like. If you're on today and you haven't pushed that like button, push that red and white heart, that blue and white thumbs up, and let us know that you're here and that you're glad that you're here. Um, for the rest of us who are on YouTube, you have one like option, which is the thumbs up. Go ahead and push that for me, uh, and let's go. Uh, we're going to kind of follow up for my Easter sermon this, today. We're following up, so uh, many of you know I'm in a series in April called Ladies First. We're looking at women who were first and had first or did things first in the Bible. That's what we're doing. I'm excited about it. I'm having fun with it. I can't wait this Sunday. Uh, we're talking about Hagar in Genesis. Um, Hagar was the first woman, and listen to this, only woman in the Bible who is recorded as giving God a name. First and only person, but also she was the first woman, and she's also the first and only person in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, to give God a name. We're going to explore that Hagar story this Sunday, so don't miss Sunday. Uh, it's a very interesting and intriguing story. It is a story that validates that there's a whole lot of like reality TV, soap opera-like drama in the Bible. If ever there's drama in the Bible, the Hagar story is one. So check us out Sunday as we continue our Ladies First series. And today, we're going to talk more about uh, what we talked about Sunday when we looked at the ladies uh, who first found G found the empty tomb. But while we're doing that, okay, I'm doing all this talk and I've not liked and shared you all. Let me share, make sure you like and share as you all are welcoming. So let me, coming in, make sure you like and share. And as soon as I get my liking and my sharing going, uh, we're gonna get, down to business. Uh, check in with me. <clears throat> all right, all right. Oh, you know what? Thank you, thank you, Evelyn Ellis. Um, Evelyn has made a great point. She says, send out 10 reminders to the church about the 10 a.m. start. We no longer start at 9 a.m. Our Sunday worship experience is at 10 a.m. this Sunday. Now, if you get there at 9, just get comfortable. Get comfortable and just start praying for the 10 a.m. worship experience. Uh, but, yes, thank you so much for that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Evelyn Ellis out of um, Vermont. Uh, we are starting our Sunday worship experience at 10 a.m. We are starting to shift. Uh, because we're getting ready for the high possibility that sometime, maybe soon, we may have to go to two worship experiences. And so we want to go to eight and 10, and we don't want to just totally disrupt people's routine. So we decided to move from nine to 10. 
Sunday at 10. Let's go in here and let's say hello. Uh, say hello to me. Even if you can't stay, come in and say hello. Hello, Yolanda. It's good to see you. Troy Valdez, Tasty West Atlanta. Great to see you today. Mocha Latte. This is Michelle Gordon, you all from Augusta, Georgia. It's great to see you. And Yolanda Ellis Taylor, good afternoon to you. Angela Cook, good afternoon, she says, church family. Always good to see you. Dr. Evelyn Ellis, who I just spoke about earlier, and I put her announcement from Vermont. Great to see you. William Bird, I great William Bird. It's good to see you. And Debbie Lewis, always great to see you. Our very own thespian, uh, great and talented sister, Shadasha of South Carolina. Are you still in Hilton Head? Um, good to see you today. And my mom, who is in New Orleans, Louisiana, it's always good to see you. Felicia Auntie Diva Holmes, great to see you. And Tashan, all the way from Grand Prairie, Texas, it's good to see you. Um, Ashanti, she says hello. She's present and in the house. Great to see you today, Ashanti, all the way from Washington, D.C. I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. next weekend. I've got a kickball tournament, Ashanti. Um, Okay, this is a great question. How can I get notified on Facebook? The only way I know to tell you is make sure you're li you like and follow our page. So go to our page um, and um, and make sure you're following. And then once you're following, you should get um, the notifications. Um, Natalie Walker Jackson, right here in Atlanta. You know, I always joke, it's not my real cousin because she has the last name Jackson. Uh, it's always good to see you. Thank you so much. Great to see you too, um, Bird. Oh, uh, Shanti, that's fine. Now, let me tell you this. It's not close. I think it's like almost 45 minutes to an hour outside of D.C. in Maryland. But I will send you the logistics anyway, but do not feel any pressure. I won't feel any kind of way if you don't make it, but I would love to see you. Would love to see you, but I just don't want you to feel pressure because I, from what I understand, where we're playing is far. Um, um, also, I, Evelyn Nelson is telling you to make sure you subscribe on YouTube, I think. Is that clicking the bell near the subscribe for YouTube? Um, oh, and there's Debbie Lewis saying thank you. It's good to see you all. All right. Um... We need a question of the day. We need a question of the day. Okay, I don't want to use the word feminism. I don't want to use the word feminism. So here's the question of the day. Um, what woman or women How do I say this? I am trying to ask, um, I am trying to ask, what, how do I want to word this today? Um, All right, y'all, this is long, but we just bear with me. Well, bear with me. Here's what I want to know today. Because I don't want you to get so caught up in the word feminism, because depending on who you are, feminism has different ideas. Some of you don't like the idea in the word feminism. So if you are anti-feminism, like in the word, don't look at the first question. Here's what I want to know. What woman or women first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be. Does that make sense? Or what woman first introduced you to womanism slash feminism? Here's what I'm trying to say. Um, and they've got a couple more hellos. So let me just say hello to a couple people who come in today. Margaret White Darby, good to see you from New Orleans. And I'm doing well. Um, oh, look at this. Let's praise break. 
Angela Cook's fourth day on her new job. We're so good, to, glad to hear that. And I hope I praise God and I pray that this is the beginning to wonders. And I pray this is the beginning to promotions. And I pray this is the beginning to financial uh, wealth and success beyond your wildest dreams. I pray this is the beginning that God will do exceedingly and abundantly far more than you can ask or imagine. But we're praising God for you. Um, Amy, good to see you. Good afternoon. And she's coming in from YouTube. It's good to see you today. Uh, and we are here. Here's the question of the day. I hope you all have liked. I hope you all have shared. I got to take this ticker off because there's only just so much my nerves can take that ticker streaming while I'm talking. What woman or women, what woman or women introduce you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Does that make sense, you all? Or what woman first introduced you to womanism or feminism? Any of those questions. I need, like, the first woman that either by conversation or by example introduced you to a strong black woman. You know, we do live in a sexist society. We do live in a society filled with male patriarchy that kind of tells us women are sub sometimes submissive, subservient, weak, emotional. And then as we experience life, we say, hey, this woman, this, this woman seems beyond that. Who is that woman for you? Does that make sense? Come on into the comment. Tell me about this woman, who they are, and kind of what they did. I like, I already like some of the first answers. Good afternoon to you, Irene Smith. It's good to see you. Uh, Angela Cook, I want you to see people praising God with you. Um, and we are answering the question of the day. And here it is. What woman, what woman or women introduced you to the idea that society expects or more that uh, that women are more than society expects or asks them to be, or what woman introduced you to the idea of womanism and feminism? Any of those? If it doesn't, if, if feminism bothers you, don't worry about that word. Don't worry about that word. And another praise, somebody joining you in praise. If feminism bothers you, don't worry about that word. If you like feminism, I really want to know who introduced you to this idea of feminism. Uh, and I have got answers for both of these questions. Uh, or just who first strong black woman that just kind of exceeded your expectations of what women were supposed to be or what women were supposed to do. Maybe it was a woman beating a man in something. Or maybe it was a woman who was working somewhere. Or maybe, maybe it was a woman who achieved something in a political sphere. Maybe it was someone close to you. This is what I want to know. What woman or woman first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Or what woman first introduced you to womanism slash feminism? Um, I like some of these answers. I like some of these. Let me give my answer as you all are looking and thinking and reflecting. If you're coming in, if you can't stay, make sure you say hi. Um, the first women that remind me, my first kind of sense of feminism, and let me explain this because I don't want y'all to think, um, were my aunts. Let me tell you why. Um, I've told you all this before. It's no mystery. Most of my aunts, most of my aunts on my father's side uh, were teenage mothers. Almost all of us who were born on my father's side from women, listen to this, were born from teenagers. Uh, my, my, my cousin Ebony, my cousin Tootie, my cousin Emily, my cousin Brian, all of us were born from teenagers. Now, I'm not sure if Letitia was born. I'm not sure. Um, uh, my, my cousin Anthony was born from a teenager. Uh, most of my aunts, hey amen, I could make a joke, but I'm not right here. But what, what, what was amazing for me was my aunts, I believe, before I was ever introduced academically or theoretically to this idea of feminism. Um, good to see you, Janine. Glad you're checking in with us today. Um, and there's Amy on both Facebook and YouTube. We're talking about strong women. And what I want to know is, this is the question of the day. Come in here and tell me. Men, if you, men in here, if there are men in here, I want you to answer this question. Because all of us have experienced a woman who blew our mind or took us past what we thought were the boundaries of who women should be or what women could do. My aunts were that for me because I saw most of my aunts as single women raise children by themselves. So why do I mean, why, what does that mean for me in terms of why? I grew up in a buried couple's family, so I didn't grow up with a woman necessarily stepping outside of, you know, heteronormative couple, married couples. But my aunts, on the other hand, were single black women, young at that, 
who had to make a way, pave a way for their kids. So they served as male roles. They served as the female roles because in many of these cases, not all, uh, the men were sometimes not there or absent or hiding in secret or it's just like, y'all, it's a lot of drama on that side of the family. Uh, but these women were the first women that kind of moved and expanded my idea of what women could be and what women should be. They shattered the mold in a lot of ways. They, they kind of helped me and showed me that uh, women could transcend these sexist ideas of what women could be, should be, and ought to be that our society sometimes imposes on women. Now, the first woman, though, that I remember ex exposing me, and I could have this wrong, but it's the first person who stands out is an author by the name of Joan Morgan. This is who introduced me to feminism, uh, and maybe she didn't introduce it to me, but it's the first book I remember reading and being captivated by on feminism. Now, if you want my opinion, I am an advocate of feminism. I'm an ally to women who support and who advocate feminism because I don't see women feminism as saying women don't want men or women don't need men. If you study feminism well, it never suggests that and it never says that. These are often caricatured versions of feminism. But the person who introduced me to feminism is a woman named Joan Morgan. She wrote a book years ago called When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. If you ever want to read a good book, I would highly recommend it. Uh, let me put it in my banner uh, in case uh, the book and the woman... Um, who introduced, who and maybe she did not introduce, maybe I'm just old and don't remember, but this is the first book that really just stands out, that really grabbed and that grabbed my attention and like really like, um, and really just, um, um, just took me somewhere else and had me really thinking. But it was it's a great book. Uh, this is also one of my long-standing academic crushes. Uh, I have a big crush on John Morgan. I was introduced to her one time on Twitter because somebody, I think I said I had a crush and I had a friend who knows her uh, and they like subtweeted me and she liked my tweet or something like that. Uh, but I have a huge crush on John Morgan. I, thought, I used to think she was one of the most attractive, sexy, smart women in the world. And she is. Beautiful woman. Smart woman. I don't know her, but I definitely have a crush on her. Great book. Joan Morgan is the person who introduced, not introduced, I don't know if she introduced me because I went to Morehouse. I'm certain that I'd had to be introduced to feminism. Uh, in fact, I know because I can remember a professor I had at Spelman who was probably the first woman, and I can't remember this lady's name, was a religion professor. I took her at Spelman. She had a high voice, great thought. First person that, I mean, now she is the first person who I can remember really challenge my idea of God and a male centric God. But anyway, Joe Morgan, that's who I'm going with. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. You answered the question, what women, let's go and look at some of y'all's answers. What woman or women first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Or what women first introduced you to the idea of womanism and feminism? I love some of these answers, so let's get into it. Mocha Latte out of Augusta says, my mom. My mom introduced me to the idea. She was the first woman who just kind of transcended the boundaries of what people told me what woman, women could be. Evelyn Ellis says, my great grandmother, I'm, oh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Aileen? I'm going to say Aileen. That is why Julia has her name as her middle name. Ma and her friend own land in Alabama when women didn't do okay. I love seeing stuff like this. This is why I'm glad I asked this question and learned something like this. Evelyn, do you know when your great grandmother was born? I'm just very interested in that because when you say great grandmother, I'm reminded that my great, great grandfather was an enslaved African named Smart Bell. When was your great grandmother born? If you know, if you don't know, that's fine as well. Uh, we're answering this question, beloved. What woman or women first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Or what woman first introduced you to this idea of womanism and feminism? Oh my goodness, your great grandmother was born in 1899. My God, that's so interesting uh, and intriguing. I see it on the comments, y'all, in case y'all didn't know. Her great grandmother was born in 1899. That means you all by 1919, she was 20 years old and when the 20 started, she was 21. And that means at some point she began to own land somewhere in the early 1900s. And that is 
phenomenal. Um, okay, I think the next person to answer our question is Amy Cowherd, my grandmother, my big sister, Alexia, when she joined the Army. Oprah Bell Hooks. Yes. Y'all know I love Bell Hooks. We had to have a whole thing on Bell Hooks when Bell Hooks passed. What woman or women introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Felicia Holmes says, my amazing mommy, Brenda Holmes, I am the woman. I am today because of her. I love that. I love that. Uh, here's an answer. Uh, Yolanda Ellis Taylor says, Hazel Patterson, she was and is a bad amen woman. Amen. We just talked about cursing Tuesday. She doesn't let, take nothing from no one, and she will set the record straight. And then my sister Eve. I love it. I love it. Uh, Evelyn Ellis says, Pastor, those aunts are some great women. Uh, and yes, they are. If you're coming in, we're answering this question. What woman or women first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society asks or expects them to be. Um, and um, Margaret White Darby says, my aunt, she taught Sunday school, Bible study, BTU. If y'all don't know what BTU is, that stands for Baptist Training Union uh, and Arts and Crafts. She also told us that you have a voice. I just love that right there and for us to use it. And let me remind someone today, you have a voice. And you ought to and you need to use it. Dion Douglas, great to see you and glad you took time to say hello. We're answering this question, Dion. What woman or women first introduced you to the idea that women are more than society expects or asks them to be? Or what woman first introduced you to womanism slash feminism? Uh, and here we go. Debbie Lewis says, my mom also, she's 82 years old, the oldest of eight limited elementary education but she showed power via raising us in the word definitely being in place as the head and never telling me in the 70s the color of my skin that i couldn't succeed in the arts thank you so much and i'm glad about that uh i want to move on um i have not seen many prayer requests i did amy i think i saw a prayer request from you um and so let me scroll down and get that prayer request. Um, and as I'm getting prayer requests, we're about to take a turn and get into our word for the day. We're about to get into our word for the day. And I have, uh, I have your prayer request. All right, you all. Um, oh, and there y'all go. Okay, is it these more prayer requests? Okay, let me get these prayer requests in. And then I'm ready to turn the corner, you all. I'm ready to turn the corner and get into this word. Um, Yolanda Davidson, I'm looking for your prayer request. Um, there we go. Uh, Michelle Gordon, there you are. Um, and who else? Uh, Natalie Walker, let me get your, um, okay. No, that's the answer to your question. Natalie Walker says, my mom, my grandmothers, and my aunts. And there you go, Natalie. There are your prayer requests. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let's get into our check-in today. Let's get into our check-in today. Uh, we are talking more about what we started on this past Sunday uh, and what the in the series that we are in, we're in a series called Ladies First, and in this last um, 
in this last Easter worship experience, we talked about the first women who saw Jesus. The first women who saw Jesus uh, in Luke 24, it's recorded. And let me go ahead and just share my screen so you all can get some of this since we are gonna read a little Bible today. Um, all right, there we go. Uh, this is the story we read on Sunday, but I'm going to take time to read it again. Let me just kind of move that screen over for you all. Here we go. Uh, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. Now, they were perplexed about this. Suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. I want to stay right here for just a while. Let me kind of go back and do this. Let me be bigger. Let me let the scripture be smaller. Uh, because what I want to talk about today is this idea um, that, um, that first and foremost, as I talked about on our Sunday, um, Jason Taylor writes, he says that if you were really trying to get a word to someone in first century Palestine, you probably would not use women. Why? Because women, there's no surprise about this, were not viewed as credible sources due to the sexism of that time. Now, I joked about this Sunday, but we could admit uh, clearly and quickly that we know that women still experience sexism in our day and in our time. Mom, thank you so much for your um, prayer request. And I have um, Cheryl Wright and her sister. What's interesting and intriguing about this text is that um, even though Jason Taylor suggests that we would not choose women, uh, the Bible says that God uh, chooses to tell angels to talk to women first to tell them that Jesus is alive. Here is how we know that even in this day, women were uh, not believed. Because uh, one of the first things we see is in verse 11, it says, these words seem to them an idle tale. Now, it does not tell us why, but we can think maybe two main things go into why. Uh, when the women come and tell the disciples and the people who were there that Jesus is alive or Jesus not in the tomb, uh, then th there are two main reasons why they might not have been believed. One it would probably just be hard to believe. It would just be hard to believe that Jesus has risen because uh, people have not experienced this. But the second reason we can um, conjecture or assume that these women would not believe is because they are women. I think this text is powerful because it reminds us, beloved, that God chooses women even when we don't. Pause right here. I'm going to come back to that because that's what I want to leave you with, right? Uh, I want to leave you with this, but I want to give you a little even more history about the Bible in this moment because these women are not strangers to the text. Notice here that the angel said, remember how he told you. So often it is the case that when we study the Bible, let me highlight that so that I can make sure you see it. In verse 6, the angel tells the women, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. What does this tell us about the women in this text? I'm glad you asked. 
it tells us, Evelyn Ellis, that women were a constant and a consistent part of the caravan of people that follow Jesus. So often in our mind, we kind of think of Jesus. And when they show these movies, they show Jesus and 12 men as if there was a singular exclusive gender of sex that was with Jesus closely. But this scripture tells us something about the caravan of people that follow Jesus. Let me give you some more evidence that women were very integral and important to Jesus's ministry. There is only one time in the Bible where it is recorded that Jesus gets financial assistance. There is only one time in the Bible where we find Jesus getting help and financial support. And here it is. In Luke chapter 8, the same woman that we saw in 24, remember Joanna, is found in Luke chapter 8. Watch this. Soon afterwards, let me get my scripture so you can see it really good. And let's change our screen so we can highlight the Bible. Soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom were seven demons gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many other women. Listen to this who provided for Jesus and the disciples out of their resources. This is interesting and this is intriguing and this is something we don't talk about often when we study the life of Jesus. Women were not only present, but were important and were the financial backbone of Jesus's ministry. Now, it's not hard to imagine that because in our churches to this day, most of the church, the black church is 80 percent women. If we take women out of the church and women's giving out of the church, 90 percent of churches would fold on tomorrow. Women were the financial backbone of Jesus's ministry. I'm not making this up. Look in Luke chapter eight. The only time it's recorded that Jesus has financial assistance. It is the credit that is given to the financial resources that back Jesus's ministry were women. This is even more intriguing in a time where women don't usually have money. I'm just trying to help somebody. Y'all, I got to move on. I got to go on. But what I'm trying to help you understand is women, all I want you to get out of this biblically is that the Bible shows us and teaches us that women are far more integral to Jesus's ministry than we know. But here's what's even more important. When people would not choose women, God will. There's two things I want you to get from this before we go and pray. The first thing I want you to get from this is this. I think it is so critically important. I think it is so critically important as we evaluate a society who oppresses people including women, that we have to understand that there is biblical evidence that God sees women differently than we do. God sees women differently than our society does. Women were always more important theologically than we understood them to be. And so maybe if we take our cue from God and from Jesus, we will become allies of women in the world. What do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked. When we know that it is true, that women have the same jobs and make less money than men. We need to be allies for women and women's rights. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that even though the Bible does not know the word feminism, there's some very feminist-ish stuff in the Bible. Not sitting here telling you that the Bible was a part of the women's suffrage movement. I'm not sitting here telling you that women, that the Bible is a part of the academic text in a feminist class. But here is what I am telling you, that there's some feminist-ish stuff in the Bible. There's some stuff in the Bible that ought to make us question 
our ideas about women. Now, let me be honest about this. And then there's some stuff in the Bible that reinforces sexism. But we know those scriptures. We know those scriptures that ask women to be second. We know those scriptures that ask women to be sub submissive. We've heard of those scriptures that ask women to be silent. It's my point and my purpose to show you that there are some counter narrative scriptures in the text that ought to make us rethink. This is not just for women. This is for men. It ought to make us rethink how we think about women. Because if Jason Taylor is right, that if we wanted a credible message to get out, we wouldn't choose women. We need to point out and notice the fact that God chooses women. Now, there is a message in that that's bigger and that's broader than just women. Here is what is also interesting and intriguing about God choosing women. God chooses those that society would not. Society wants our pastors to be perfect. God does not. In fact, God chooses faulty people. God chooses frail people. God chooses fickle people. I read this the other day because God does not have an option. I wish I could tell you, and that's why so often when I preach and when I pray, I remind myself, God, and everyone who can hear me, that I am not much. I'm felt, I'm faulty. I fail all the time. I mess up all the time. I live below the mark all the time. But here's the truth of the matter. God doesn't have the option to pick a perfect person because there is not one. And that might not make everybody happy, but it does make somebody happy that God can choose us that God chooses against the grain of what humans choose. And so whoever has told you you're good enough, God thinks you're good enough. Whoever has told you you're not good enough, God thinks you're good enough. God reminds us over and over and over again that we are good enough for God. Even when society holds us back, even when society does not want us, even when society tells us that we are not enough, even when society tells us that we are too female, that we are too poor, that we are too uneducated, that we are not articulated, that we are not degreed enough, that we don't have enough on our resume, God chooses who God chooses. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And that's what I'm here to tell you. God chose me at 10, not because I knew it all, not because I had gone to seminary, but I believe God called me at 10 because God had a calling over my life. And this is what I remember, just for, like we talk about the song, or we remember the song that says, this joy that I have, the world did not give it to me and the world cannot take it away. I want to tell someone today, the anointing on your life, the world did not give it and the world cannot take it away. The calling on your life, the world can, did not give it and the world cannot take it away. The glory on your life, the world did not give it and the world cannot take it away. The protection over your life, the world did not give it and the world did not take it away. And so I need to convince people today to begin to walk tall in your calling, walk tall in your destiny, walk tall in your aspirations, walk tall in your ambitions, because what God has for you, it is for you, even when you're not believed even when they count you out, even when they doubt you, even when they dismiss you. Because listen, the very first people who told the story of resurrection were doubted, were dismissed, were disbelieved, were disenfranchised, were dismissed, and were just plain old dis. But can I tell you something? The Bible says, be ye not dismayed. Whatever be tied. That's not the Bible. That's the song. Beneath God's wings of love abide. God will take care of you. And I don't know who needed to hear that today, but that's what I want to walk into the tomorrow of our lives believing, that God will take care of you. There's somebody here who doesn't know about how your tomorrow is going to end. There's somebody here who does not know how it's going to work it out. But that's what I want to convince you of today is that God will take care of you. That's what I like. It said, the song says, God will take care of you through every day over all the way. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And there's somebody here today 
who needs to be reminded that God cares for you, that God calls you, that God chooses you, that God protects you, that God anoints you, that God certifies you, that God stamps you, that God delivers you. And no matter who or what or when or what society standards try to tell you about you, just like the women in this text, when God gives you a word, you've got to speak it. When God gives you a business, you've got to create it. When God gives you a book, you've got to write it. When God gives you a person, you've got to follow them. Follow it. When God gives you a calling, you've got to answer it. When God gives you a path, you've got to walk it. When God gives you a word, you've got to talk it. When God gives you an anointing, you've got to live in it. When God gives you a praise, you've got to shout it. I didn't even mean to go here, but I feel my help right now because there's somebody who God has given something and you are not using it. I'm through y'all. I'm through. We're going to be here Sunday. We're going to be here Sunday at 10 a.m. But there's something profound about this idea that God calls and picks women. I think it's so important for us to be reminded that women had a much more integral role in the ministry and in the life of Jesus. And then that reminds us something about how God can go against the grain of society. That's why the Bible says in the kingdom of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There's always something about radical followers of Christ who are countercultural. There's always something about radical followers of Christ that go against the grain. So I want to encourage someone to walk into your own path, even if it goes against the grain, to walk into your own calling, even if the world does not believe you or think you can. There are so many examples of God anointing people that the world would not call. And it worked out. Jesus is such a person. The world, if the world was picking a savior, wouldn't pick a nappy-headed Negro from Nazareth. They wouldn't have picked some child who was born questionably under questionable circumstances, who most people believe his mom was a teenage pregnant mother who got pregnant before she got married. That's not who we would have picked. But God picks people who go against the grain and God picks us. So believe in God's call on your life. Believe in God's anointing on your life. Believe in the glory that God has put on your life. Believe in the assignment that God has given for your life. And walk heavy, walk tall, walk proud. God, we love you today. We honor you and we thank you. We thank you for this time and this opportunity together that we have to check in and to check you out, God. Today, we're grateful uh, about the unique and powerful way that you have used women in the ministry of Jesus and how you have used women after the resurrection. God, we thank you that you took angels and you could have sent those angels anywhere. You could have sent those angels to anyone, but the Bible says the angels went on a beeline to, to the women. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James. And we wanna thank you, God, for what that teaches us and what that tells us today. Today, God, we come praying, God, not for just ourselves, but for people on our minds and our spirits. God, today, we pray right now for Cheryl Wright and her sister as she is transitioning from carnal to spirit, from earth to heaven, from terrestrial to celestial. Be with her on that way and touch all those who are mourning and grieving and dealing with this transition. I pray right now for Aaron Jackson and Natalie Jackson and Ariel and Nevin Jackson. Touch and anoint as only you can. Paris Jones, Lakia Jones, Kelly Meadow, Michael Meadow, Brian Gordon and Michelle Gordon. God, I'm praying that your anointing would fall fresh so that they would feel a fresh wind from you. Laureen Simmons fam family and family and Jan Davenport, God, I'm praying that you would touch them right now and touch in a way that only you can. God, I'm praying for every person that we've called by name. I'm praying for Amy Cowherd's, uh, Amy Cowherd's hiking group as they approach up the Appalachian Trail this weekend. I'm praying for Joy Ford and Tanina Truesdale and Boyd Harris and Amy Cowherd. 
I'm lifting for before you right now, Juan Carlos, Heather Manley, Jane Simons, Lauren Murray, Sonia Johnson Clark, Joy Treadwell, John Beatty, Ruthie Prophet, Samuel Perry, Tracy Blackwell, and James Walker. God, for every name I've listed, you know the circumstance. For every name I've listed, you know the situation. For every name I've lift, list, lifted, you know the, the, um, the situation. And so, God, I'm praying that you would touch as only you can touch. Heal as only you can heal. Deliver as only you can deliver. Block haters right now. Block the demons right now. Block the darts from the devil right now. But God, also block the demons that are in us. God, for right now, I come rebuking the demons that hold us back. I come rebuking the demons that keep us back. God, and so right now, I come rebuking low self-esteem. I come rebuking uh I come rebuking low self-image. I come rebuking doubt. I come rebuking depression. I come rebuking despair. I come rebuking all those things that are in us and with us that hold us back. I come rebuking procrastination. I come rebuking addiction. I come rebuking disease. I come rebuking, God, all those things that keep us from being our best self. Free us, God. Clear us, God. Remove those things from us, God, that are keeping us from your best blessings and your choices anointing. In the name of Jesus, God, we are praying and believing that there is greater in our future, that there is more for our path, and that you can do by the power that is work at work within us far more exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask and imagine. Let it be so right now. Let our dreams be so right now. Let our aspirations be so right now. Let our hopes be so right now. Bless our children right now. And God, I also pray uh, for Lexington and for Benika and Leroy Thayer as they are dealing with the trials of sleeplessness and insomnia. May you heal in only the ways that you can. May you help them discover in all the ways you can. And God, I pray this prayer, believing that you're moving and promising you that as you continue to move, we will continue to give you the glory and the praise. This is my prayer. I pray it in the loving, liberating, and life-giving name of Jesus. Amen. And thank God. Beloved, I want to thank you, thank you, thank each and every one of you for joining us for our community check-in today. Um, this Sunday, we are worshiping at 10 a.m., and as we go to our many different destinations, I am touching and agreeing with you. And so, Michelle, I'm touching and agreeing with you. Yolanda, I'm touching and agreeing with you. Evelyn Ellis, I'm touching and agreeing with you. Amy Cowherd, I'm Yolanda Ellis Taylor, I am touching and agreeing with you. Listen, beloved, may God bless each and every one of you. May God keep each and every one of you. And please, please, please remember to live in love. I'm touching and agreeing with you too, mama. And as Amy said, blessings until we meet again.